Welcome to episode 70 of Taste My Game Face. I am your host, Azizi Adiemo, joined today by Joe Knight. Hello. And the show's producer, Alan Heath. Hello. How are we doing today then, guys? Yeah, we're good. Yeah? You good? Yeah, yeah I'm all right. So, I'm answering for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're fine. <laughs> Stop asking me all these questions. <laughs> um, so... Um, there's been an interesting game that's come out pretty recently. We, t- we talked about it in our year roundup episode. Or was it the one after where we were talking it about was our things? Ex- excited about. games yeah, of yeah, the yeah. year. Um, which is King Come Deliverance. Yep. Um, and I've been kind of noticing that in various parts of the internet that I go to to talk about video games or read things that other people have said about video games, there's lots and lots of chatter about it. But you, Joe, are the only person that's been playing it on the podcast. So <sighs> yeah. tell me all. Okay, so Kingdom Come Deliverance is a, I guess, medieval kind of life sim. So it's kind of like you're trying to get all the bits of medieval life like thrown into it. And that takes the form of like a kind of, I guess, the best light comparison is like a, into a kind of Skyrim-y RPG, RPG. Yeah, it has like... At first glance, it looks quite similar to an Elder Scrolls game. Yeah, and it looks really nice because it's in CryEngine 3. Um, But it's taken lots of steps to try and make itself a little bit more, I guess, um, complicated. And I guess also, though, at the same time, rewarding. You know, it's got a very different approach to how, how a game might do combat. It's not like, let's go and just swipe our sword. Uh, whoever it is it's got a kind of like a five point star system where you try and pull one of the sticks to kind of aim for a head or an arm or the central mass and you're trying to get your sword around their kind of their armor and their own defensive positions which is really interesting but really hard to get your head around which kind of works as the whole game is really interesting but really hard to get your head around so like skyrim we're talking a first person um like medieval rpg but unlike skyrim it's not fantasy um and then i mean i always found i've always found in all of the elder scrolls games that the combat leaves a lot to be desired that even even as they have made improvements in it even though it feels a little bit more kinetic like the the balance is all wafty and and nothing really feels like hitting (laughs) anybody properly it's like click that mouse till man falls down like yeah like and um kingdom come deliverance tries to be uh, way more deliberate with what you're doing so i guess the kind of bring it together i think it i actually feel one of the things that this game has been getting a lot of praise for and granted I'm about five hours into it like that's not my that's not on my own terms that's the fact that this game has been a arsehole to try and play <laughs> in its launch week it's consistently updating um, and thus making my uh, PlayStation 4 relatively redundant so I'd like to have played more than I have but um, the story is you're this guy called Henry whose father's a blacksmith <laughs> And you're kind of going for your day-to-day life in this small village. Village gets attacked. Parents get killed. And then you're brought into this grand sweeping tale of vengeance. And so far, so I've heard it before. You know, it, I, I, I really kind of feel that. Like, I mean, it's interesting to have the magic and stuff taken out. But I actually feel that the core storyline, the setup at least, it's like, it's like Conan. You know, like it's, it's it's like Oliver Stone's Conan, and it's that, like Conan without the lizard men. Yeah, Conan without the lizard men. But yeah, like and you know, know sometimes lizard men are good, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, at the same time, it's I don't know. It's it's quite difficult for me to buy in the, into the characters. Um, and I guess one of the things that's worth mentioning is it's relatively for something that's so epic and sweeping. 
it's got a lot of budgetary constraints. So before we talk about those budgetary constraints, you kind of like raised something interesting in terms of the story. So what I've noticed people saying around the internet about it is that it's kind of nice and refreshing to have a game that, and I, this seems contrary to what you're saying, but a game that where, although it has kind of typical game tropes, the stakes aren't that high that instead of trying to save like the galaxy or the world it's like all taking place in a relatively contained little part of eastern europe of um what's it called bohemia yeah but yeah. i mean but at the same time it's i i find that difficult to wash with because like local stakes well, still stakes, right? So it's still got that, like, you know, that big driving overarching war epic going on, you know? And it's just your role in it is much more, I, I guess, much more minor. But at the same time, it being a role-playing game, the conversations you have with people and the gravitas that's put upon that, it, it like, it still feels like you must, like, you know, we must do this to save this situation or we must do this to, uh, like, further our own cause. And that that's not that much of a change up, really. Just it, just if you zoom the stakes in, it doesn't mean that they're not stakes. You know, I mean, you aren't the chosen one. Is probably a better way to kind of put that. So it's not a it's not a power fantasy. There's no you're not a level above everybody. You know, which is like the kind of you know that's the Skyrim Dragonborn approach, right? That's mm-hmm. that's that's what that is. Um, but for me, I find it. <sighs> I don't know it is it is kind of nice to not to like f- feel useless which is something that I don't think is always intentional <laughs> the, the game puts <laughs> forward um but when you start you are a, it's like you're a bit of a chump like there's not really you can't really engage with any of the systems until you've kind of got yourself whooped by them you know you can't like engage in combat until oh, you've yeah, been but, punched in the face a few times sounds, yeah. but that sounds like you're just talking about an eastern european video game <laughs> yeah and it's and you know how I feel about that kind of East Block gaming. It's like, I love it. But oh God, it's so janky. Like, ever since, like, you know, I'd like Stalker, really, I like, I love their approach because it's... I think one of the differences, though, with this particular game is it has a very kind of linear opening. So it's not that kind of thing that I really like about those kind of games where they just drop you... And they're like somewhere go. in the middle of the yeah, landscape not, and go yeah, fucking work no, it out. It's no kill Straylock like <laughs> in those regards. But I think, I don't know, it's just, I think really, and it's probably worth just getting to this as quickly as possible, is that the game fundamentally at the moment doesn't work, which, you know, when I'm posed the question on the podcast, how is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> because it's not fucking finished <laughs> like the, the like the concepts and the ideas that exist within it are so like captivating to me but the playing of it it's fucking ice skating uphill like it's so difficult <laughs> like they're, they're those little things that they've tried um, to boil it down to a kind of a one-time example is like lock picking right we're familiar with lock picking mini games yeah from your thieves to your morrowinds like there's there's a lock picking mini game it's all right? about lining things up the right yeah. way so that you can turn the now <laughs> bear with me while i try and explain lock picking in this game so with the right thumb stick you push up a small circle out of the lock you then rotate that round till you find the sweet spot then with your left thumb you then try and rotate round the um the lock itself as you move the lock round the point that you need to be on changes. So you're moving both thumbsticks around at the same time. As a man that suffers from relatively shaky hands, I have yet to open a fucking chest. I swear to you, I've been playing this game for fucking <laughs> hours. Yeah. And I can't open a chest. Yeah. It's, and, and like, there's like, a, there was like a mini game where someone was like, do you want to learn how to open chests? And I was like, yeah, he was like, here you go. Here's a practice chest. I practiced over and over and over again, like five times. Then I can't work out whether or not it was the end of the quest or whether I pulled a little bit in my own frustration too hard right when I ended one of the lock picking sections, I 
flew sideways and seemed to disengage from the mission. Now, I don't know if this is fact or a little bit of a bug or something, but to me, it looked like the man that was giving me the mission put his hand up to his forehead and shook his head. <laughs> don't know if I saw that, but like it, I, that was how I felt. Yeah. <laughs> then I tried to re-engage with the quest. Quest is gone. <laughs> it's just disappeared. I can't talk to him about practicing opening wait, wait, chests. Wait, wait, so anymore. hold on, so hold on. We're talking about a game that feels like it's a a kind of attempt to do Skyrim in a little bit more of a kind of contained way. And here we are with a vast host of bugs that make the game almost unplayable. It fucking sounds like they hit the nail on the head. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It's definitely the Bethesda mod- model, you know, push it out the door and we'll sort it out later. Like, that's no, the, the, no, let's let's not pretend that Bethesda ever sorts fucking anything out later. Like, yeah, no, leave that to the that, people that make the mods. That's true, that's true. But I, in, in Bethesda's defence, when I played Skyrim on PS3, like a year and a bit after it came out, it played fine for me. Oh, okay. So, you know. Wait, what? Played fu- You You didn't hit a single bug? I mean, a random random like there was probably a cow flying through the air at some point but like nothing game breaking in okay, any way yeah. not even close <clears throat> but that but in kingdom come those things build up on you right mm. like and with the way with how kind of low on resources and low on systems it is it's like well i guess high on systems but low in resources you know you're used to walking around a skyrim environment and you see like you know everything you can kind of pick up and interact with mm. there's actually very little i was like really surprised when i walked up to a log that had an axe sticking out of it and i couldn't pick up the axe you know mm. like that stuff feel, f- feels kind of like weird to me it's not quite the sim level that i would expect but at the same time like <laughs> To give an example, there is a mission early on where you have to steal a suit of armor from a room. Yeah. This room is on a battlements patrolled by guards. You're not allowed to go into the room. If you go into the room, the guards spot you, right? And so you're kind of walking around these battlements trying to work out how to get in. But here's the rub. The area of effect, you're not warned of this, is even when you're a bit outside the room. So if you're going down the alleyway, which is the only way to get to the door that, that exists in this room, it triggers the guards that are walking past to walk into the room, right? So I was standing there thinking to myself, oh my God, I've hit some sort of bug. I'm going to have to go back and reload. So I went back and I reloaded. And I, played, I played another hour that I'd already played again, just so I could kind of see if I'd made some sort of mistake, maybe going into this room too early and triggering this bug. No, I didn't. Yeah, so then I was left in this situation an hour later, back at the same point with exactly the same fucking problem. And I was sitting there going like, what am I going to do? What the fuck am I going to do here? I've got to steal this. And this is kind of where the genius of the game also is apparent. So I ran into the room and the guards were like, what are you doing here? And, he was, and one of the guards was like, I'm coming to get you. And I, I walked him around an alleyway. And then he chilled and was like, oh, it's fine. You've left the room. He turned around. I was like, I'm sorry, mate. It's the devs. It's not me. This isn't how I want this to be. Grabbed him around the neck, choked him out, pushed him down to the floor. Then looted his armor and was like, this is how I think is the only way that I can solve this situation outside of the mission parameters that I have. It fucking worked. Wait, wait, wait. Is in it, uh, t- taking the armor of the guard instead of the armor that you were supposed to steal was fine? Yeah. So I had the armor. Oh, that's so there's a, little, there's a little clap for that. Yeah, that's quite good. But at the same time... I was forced into this character that I don't like very much who does things like this. Like, I don't want that. Because, like, to be honest, I was put up against this this decision, which is like, once I clear this room of guards, I've got to do that fucking lockpicking minigame again, which I can't do. So, like, that's <laughs> another, like, you know, like, that's another thing on top of that. <laughs> You know, and there are archaic systems that make these things more problematic. Like, you can only save by going to sleep. Unless you have a really expensive save tonic in your inventory that you can drink at any point, right? But with the way that, because I don't have faith in the systems, I want to actually be able to save when I choose. And that isn't because I think that the simulation aspect of it is bad. It's because actually the infrastructure 
and the um the deliberate nature of me being able to set things up it isn't actually there you know like i'm all, it's always i'm taking a punt yeah no i mean it's fucking it's the return of open world problems right like if you have a game that it might break on you any second you need to be able to have multiple saves to go back to it's to a point where it's not broken like that needs to be something that's available and i mean if you if you decide to make a save system that requires that well that only happens this often then you need to damn well make sure that people do not need to save more often than that yeah that's really difficult because i feel like i'm really bagging on this game but i do feel that there is something in it you know like i really see kind of what they're kind of trying to go for it's just if they polished everything up a little bit more and also maybe made it a little bit more for a game that launched on pc and two consoles the it is not built for consoles at all like i but i believe this lock picking mini game is about um keyboard and mouse interaction where i can see in my head that that's something that would work right so do you think that the reason that it's kind of ended up as shonky as it has is because it's this kind of kickstarter funded well this quasi kickstarter funded game that like they didn't have the the cash the funds to finish it yeah, absolutely yeah yeah but also at the same time that I, to, I really want to stress like the vision that this game has is so beyond what you would expect from a kickstarter well you say that except that was that was what was completely apparent when the Kickstarter started off, like I and I ended up looking at it and going, "Oh my god, how the hell do they think they're going to achieve all of this on Kickstarter money?" And, well, and they they were sensible enough to explain. They were like, "Well, we're not just getting Kickstarter money. Like, if we get funding from Kickstarter to show that there is support from it, the majority of our funding will come from outside of Kickstarter." But they need to see that first. Um, but at the same time, I still I don't think they had as much well as much money as your average triple a game would and all, and it sounds like they had kind of triple a level uh, intent um that they haven't been able to fully execute on but also at the same time i'm moaning about it but i do want to play more of it you know like i i do believe that in a fortnight this game is going to be a lot better than it is now mm. you know and i think i think over the next 6 months it's going to become like a almost a completely different game experience. You know experience. what? That's that's basically every fucking game now, though. Yeah, it? but like, yeah, but this is in this is in dire need of having that. This is like a game that the systems are almost too hard to interact with. I I will say that I am enjoying some of the systems. Like I think the fighting is great. Mm. Yeah, like, I think it's really good. It's very deliberate. It's um, it's it's really brutal and it's very cat and mousey every enemy is a is a his own obstruction like there's no like if you get ganged up on in this game you're you're done and every enemy is well designed to be relatively unique people have different styles that they might fight weapons really change how they move and how they act and i think that stuff's really like laudable i just want to be able to get to more of it because to be honest i've only i've only had I've had a couple of fist fights, one fight with one bandit, and a sort of boss fight that you have to lose. And like that's how and if I've been playing for like five hours and that's like all I've got down me at the moment. I'm not about to go punching villagers in the face just because I want to fight. <laughs> like But yeah, it's I don't know, like, it's so interesting. It takes me back to that kind of, you know, those salad days of like you know, mid to late nineties PC gaming where you get like a game that's like a concept <laughs> and you're like desperately waiting for that concept to be realized either by like, you know, like patches or mods. <laughs> and I just and I just I just feel that. And it does it has led to some great bugs. Like I saw I saw one on, on like on on the internet the other day of like uh, someone firing a bow at a guard on a bridge and then the guard teleport fly kicked him in the face like it was <laughs> Like like it was from Mortal Kombat. And I was just like, go over <laughs> did, he, did, he, did he turn around to face him first? Was he like, fucking fire a bow at me? Whoop! <laughs> 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 
super good. Like, and, and and it has that kind of because that's actually part a part of playing it now. I feel like they're. <sighs> It's one of those ones where the early adopters of it will remember the broken mess that it was because actually there is a bit of joy in the imperfection, you know, like that. That and I'm watching it grow as a concept is going to be something that's really good because I mean, I like for example that lock picking mechanic is just obviously something that doesn't work on consoles, you know, like that's that that's as plain as day to me, and they will replace that with something that is serviceable and does work, you know, but like. There's something that I I will remember this game as that game where I couldn't open a chest, you know, <laughs> like, and that is kind of brilliant in it in its own way. As frustrating as it is, I've got confidence that they're going to patch that up. But it, it's just so it's really hard to recommend in the state that it is now. It sounds like the kind of thing that should have done early access on PC for a while, because they, if there's as much as yeah, there's mechanics like the lock picking that don't work with a <laughs> controller. If there's all these other bugs that probably, if it was out in the wild for six months to a year while they were working on it, they probably could have ironed a lot of that out before attempting to put it over. I mean, if the the fact that they bought it to two concerts, it's like a Kickstarter game, probably not a massive team. It's an open world game in quite a complex engine. I think it's a pretty, I actually think it's a pretty sizable team. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, it's like 70 guys, I think. Yeah, oh, but when actually, that's fairly small. Yeah, yeah like, but like, when you're talk- thinking about, like, yeah, Bethesda games have hundreds of people working on them and they're still full of bugs. So it's just open world games are hard. Mm-hmm. And to do that on a Kickstarter is hard enough without having to spread yourself over multiple platforms. But I also think that that's sort of part of the problem because they've kind of hoisted themselves on their own petard, right? They were like, we're going to do Kickstarter, we're going to do Triple A. And like, because it actually markets itself as the answer to AAA. Yeah, it's like we are so all the of those things. Bugs. No, but <laughs> but like I can see but but again that's the that's the real shame of its launch is I can see what they meant. Mm. Yeah. I see that in the combat. I see that in the systems upon systems that they've created and how kind of like wholly committed to the sim it is. Like I see that. But it just doesn't come together so well. And there's money, like the money misspend throughout it is, is difficult because like the voice acting is massively inconsistent. Like you've like, <laughs> I'm meant I'm, I'm meant to be walking around 14th century Bavaria. And there's like one man over here. who has got a Cornish accent. There's one man over here. who's an American. And they're like, you know, like it's, it's, that's difficult. And somewhere in it, is Brian motherfucking <laughs> blessed. I haven't got to him yet, but I'm looking forward to it. But I'm sure that he was all of the money. <laughs> yeah. Is he the king? Uh, well, uh, there are multiple kings, oh. so I'm hoping he's he is one of them. the king? <laughs> I just hope that there's some sort of Hawkman twist towards like, the latter part of the game. Gone's alive! <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, man, if only a character's name was Gordon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of... Henry, which I don't know, is that a name from that part of the world, or is that something that we can just? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Why Hen- not? Hen- Henry's, Henry's a name that's got around. Yeah, yeah, I suppose it has got around, hasn't yeah. it? I just like so put that into the British pantheon of kings. I mean, we have fucking eight of them. Yeah, but I mean, like, yeah. been some Viking Henrys as well. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. So, sure. guess about Henry's get about Pro- probably got into <laughs> like. Eastern Europe Germany as well why not yeah but yeah man I want to recommend this game guys I really 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 do but I really 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 can't it's real difficult it's really difficult maybe it's it's one of those games we need to do like a six month update how is this game now yeah I mean like I think I'm going to be I've got this very weird like dynamic with it where like at work one of the four other people that are playing Kingdom Come Deliverance also exist and like so we're kind of like camping out and being like uh, this game is really interesting but super broke and it's like what broke thing happened to you when you were playing it last night and uh-huh. then he tells me and that's and that's kind of good but I think that actually having that kind of dialogue and relationship with someone about it is something that's going to weirdly keep me like pressing through with it because like if I can go into work and at the beginning of every day I can go hey bro what fucked up shit happened to you in this game last night I mean, just remember remember the share button 
we need to make a montage of bugs okay. at some point. <laughs> okay. Oh, I should have got the too many gods, too many gods, <laughs> all bunched up, overlapping each other in that one room. Oh man. <laughs> um. So, like, you you were telling me that you wanted to play a little bit of the game today before you headed over here to record this. Yes. Yeah, so I woke up nice and early. Yeah. Let's. And maybe we should rewind that. So on the day I bought Kingdom Come Deliverance, I so, Ran down Argos, the place to be if you're buying video games on your lunch break. Just saying, a little bit of money off, a couple of quid here and there. I'm always giving Argos the props. Cheap Amiibos at the moment as well, 4 99 a pop. <laughs> Go for it. But yeah, I, I ran down there, grabbed it, ran home, and then whacked it in thinking to myself, yeah, you know what, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. 23 gigabyte download instantly. Got love uh, that day one yeah, patch. My internet is... <laughs> bollocks as well so I was just left being like alright let's see if I can get an hour into this like, it comes around it finishes at 12 o'clock at night my download and I'm like oh well I've got work tomorrow so this is bedtime for me so I guess I won't be playing Kingdom Come Deliverance an interesting thing happened in that moment though where because I couldn't play Kingdom Come Deliverance but I wanted to experience something about it I kind of went online and was like oh I wonder how it's doing reviews wise and instead of getting reviews, I noticed that it was like director of Kingdom Come Deliverance is a bit of a knobhead. And so I went down that hole. And I th- and that was really saddening. <laughs> Cause he's a bit pro gamergate. He's a bit of a fucking dickhead, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's not. Oh, so because I I don't fucking apologize to people like this, but like he's not like he doesn't appear to be the worst, most toxic person in the world. But you know, like that guy at uni who's on the fucking rugby team that you just wish would fuck off. <laughs> he's him. Okay. And that man still needs to fuck off. You know, <laughs> like, and he's got some funny ideas about how things work, but he kind of has pointed that into the direction of what's made his philosophy about you know combating things in the triple way sphere but you know yeah. there's, so there's it's this kind of aggravates me because because i i found out about this and i completely forgot that he's a bit of a dickhead a bit of a fucking gamer gator and i it, if I'd remembered, it would probably have like changed what I said about the games that I was looking forward to in a looking forward to this year kind of episode. Um, but yeah, like he's he's clearly a bit of a fucking asshole. Yeah. Um, but in that kind of strident, I'm right, you're wrong, you just have to deal with what, what I say, universe. And that probably means that, like you say, that means that he's in a position to push against the mainstream of what video games are with an idea of his own vision in mind um yeah i don't know what, but it's so yeah. difficult because it all because knowing that going in and this i guess is the more interesting part of this topic is knowing that going in tempers my ability to enjoy its storytelling i guess mm. like literally a woman came by our oh, smithy me and my dad are sitting there jamming out and like she's like I want to buy some nails sell her some nails I go fetch them for her bring them over and then she turns around and you know she's in full peasant long skirt garb you know just looking like a regular regular guy camera zooms in on her bum and dad's like oh she's a fine lass isn't she and I was like I didn't know Hideo Kojima was working on this game (laughs) Oh, oh, I, I'm, I'm not sure though. <laughs> that could just be funny as fuck though. Uh, no, because it, it isn't. Like, like tonally, it isn't. It's like they're setting her up to. She, I've had subsequent dealings with her since, and she is set up to be, you know, a, a romance interest. Oh, okay. and I find, I like, but instantly, like, like I never would have like seen that and just been chill about it, I, I would have brought it up anyway. But contextually, I feel so mm. much more about it because I know maybe where that comes from. And yeah. that is also making it a bit of a fucking test. Oh, dear. 
So is yeah. it a bit of a bro down in general? Yeah, it is a bro down. Like there are early missions which are about you politically disagreeing with someone and then throwing shit at his house. Because, you know, that's the answer to a political disagreement down the pub. Oh, let's go by his house with with your bros. Yeah. And throw shit at his house. And I was like, oh, okay, this is cool. This is an RPG. Let's find the way that I can talk myself out of this. Yeah, it wasn't really a way to do that. I, You know, the thing is, though, I think maybe <laughs> medieval times pe- people were just a little bit like that. I think yeah, that but, generally might have been what yeah, was Yeah, but going do on. I have to be? <laughs> that's, that's my life. Yes. 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 If you want to play that game, Look, yes, you I fucking already do. already choked a man out to steal some armor because the game is broken. And did you throw shit at his house afterwards, though? Because if you haven't, uh, then you're not know, fully if, buying if, into if, your if character. I don't know where he lived. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, it's difficult. I I don't know. Just leave the leave the cod piece to the armor on his doorstep with a shit in it. Yeah, that's the solution. And then okay. set it on fire <laughs> in a paper bag. Yeah, oh, I need uh, Zelda levels of uh, systemicness to get to that. <laughs> so is that essentially what you're saying that Zelda is a better open world game? Oh hell, <laughs> well I mean like Zelda is like the best open world game that has open worlded in a very long time. Yeah, I've played a shitload of Zelda since our last podcast. Yeah, you, I was completely convinced to buy it after you and Dan told me how amazing it was. How are you finding it? It's interesting. Cause, because systemically, it's incredibly tight and wonderfully tuned. And all of the interactions in open worlds that should, no, that should work but don't. The open world problems that have existed in these games forever are not there and that's wonderful like if you think that a thing should work because of the way that you understand the world it does yeah but unlike you and dan i'm finding that the story isn't having the same and I, no let me rephrase this the writing is not having the same impact that i think it has for you that in kind of the tone of the world there's this wonderful kind of like forlorn like melancholy to it that's there all of the time but in terms of the actual uh communication with other characters in that world it feels like it's doing something that is very very old school that it is it's giving you the pieces of information you need to move forward and it's trying to give you a little bit of flavor around that but the flavor isn't particularly insightful um, and that it's just kind of throwing hints at you for how to do mechanics a lot of the time rather than having anything that, that draws you into the characters. And I think that's really an interesting standpoint to meet it on because fucking games are the ghost of my conscious life, right? <laughs> like every, everything that's happening there is about a kind of subversion of Zelda, you know, and Zelda was given to me the first one when I was seven, you know, and has been a part of my life ever since. So for me, I'm really, I can, for me, it's tropes being subverted, you know, but if you don't know them, then it must be really difficult to meet Zelda on those kind of, um, I don't know, like, like on that kind of goodwill term that I do, because it's so, it's so different and so bizarre and such a double down on the things that I like about the franchise, that kind of kooky weirdness that sometimes is around the edge of a Zelda that they never really go into unless you're fucking Majora's Mask, which is the the second best Zelda game now. But obviously this one entirely doubles down on that and everything in it is about that odd space, but it's still, and I think... I, this is something that's apparent in Mario as well. Like the the way that the writing comes together, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it's it's written in a way to be to be interesting in the in the actual words that are used. It's that the whatever's being communicated to you is just a I, I guess a cursory translation of the original Japanese without actually trying to add any flavour or charm in there. I don't know. I think that does exist in... I think that exists in Zelda more than it does in Mario. But I wanted to kind of go back to a point that... Because I was listening back to our old episode and I was thinking there there was this point where we were talking a lot about, um, you know, you guys were saying that you wanted a little bit more 
me out of these games and I was very much on the back foot defending it saying like if you want that maybe you should go looking at the Mario RPGs and blah 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 and I was kind of thinking about that and thinking to myself that actually that's a resource that Nintendo have maybe if they brought that personality and that stuff from that kind of weird small really core nintendo thing maybe that's their next move if they can bring that personality over like those guys that write like that localize them if they could bring them over into this kind of bigger thing and let them have more free reign with it then actually like we probably would have better games so Mm. i kind of can see my point on that he's still yeah. fucking fantastic though. yeah no for but sure and I, I don't I mean because mm-hmm. I've been playing it as well I started playing it after the last podcast um, and I'm actually finding myself getting really frustrated with the game uh, mainly to do with I guess anything to do with the combat so I think I think there's something because it's my first Zelda as well I think maybe this is something that's happening for me a lot more than it might do for you say joe which is that the the understanding of the systems and the mastery thereof is something that happens really really slowly and like every time i work out a little extra bit of how i can be more capable in combat i'm like oh shit oh i can do this thing i had no idea this is excellent or like just just recognizing that the way that the the world works is a little bit better realized than i thought before like recognizing that you can kind of get around blocks and things like that by by doing sensible things rather than by actually being on the right side of a shield and things like that rather than just yeah just yep, attacking at the right time but i mean for me the, the the i mean i guess the main gist of the combat is something you even mentioned that when you first started playing it was a frustration for you and the, the weapon breaking system yeah so far in the game I don't understand why. Apart okay. from just the general, like, oh, we want you to experiment with different weapons. It's like, okay, that's fine. But then I've come across situations where it's just like, all right, I've got into a shrine, ex- up to this point, expecting shrines to be puzzles, and then it's a combat, and it's a combat with a tough enemy, and all I've got is one sword and a few sticks. Yeah. And it's like, that one sword broke after three hits, and he's still got a mountain of health left. And it's like, okay, so the only thing left for me to do is stun and throw a bomb. You, you know what though? That, did you did those, you win? No. Those, okay, but I that's... kept giving up, and like I'm at the point now where I'm literally avoiding combat because I don't enjoy it. Because oh, it's like, all right, I'm just gonna. I've got an axe, a one cool sword that's on the brink of breaking. A those, couple of right, sticks and clubs from the enemies. Those shrines, the the combat shrines, they they still feel like puzzles. Like it took me a while to work out how to take on those enemies, but now I see specifically which weapon they're using and i work out how to take them on based on that so i and and this is what i'm talking about like it's it's cleverer than it first appears and i really really appreciate that about it and that's where i where you are is exactly where i was with it Mm. So my advice to you is to put it down for six months and then sort of in the back of your mind, spend the entirety of that six months sort of thinking about why you don't like Zelda and then pick it up again. That's terrible advice. Take Izzy like, uh, this particular um, I mean, no, but the, but the reason but I've been able to like, the reason I have been playing it loads is because I, I've had surgery on my leg, which means that I've just been sitting at home for the last two weeks with nothing to do apart from play video games. So maybe it's not I'm so growing bad. a handsome beard. And growing had some beard apparently. <laughs> um, I just fucking is scraggly as fuck, mate. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I can't, I can't get to my shaver at the moment. It's up the stairs. Um, so, so I, I've kind of, I've kind of pit myself against a few games. Um, I finished Celeste, which was amazing. I, I act, actually have to say this on the podcast. Everything that I said last episode about how fucking fantastic Celeste was, it got better. Times it by a million. Every aspect. <laughs> every fucking aspect it is a thing of beauty it is one of the very finest games that i've played and i don't think enough people are getting involved so seriously yeah. well we'll talk about it once properly once I'd, more of us I'd have really finished like it. to do a spoiler cast for it yeah we'll get there because, All right. because but right the now we're fantastic at the time <laughs> um i but you gotta just of... end up repeating yourself <laughs> <laughs> so let's but, save it for save it for a spoiler cast yeah you're, maybe you're right maybe you're right but the gameplay manages to improve like 
on on top of all of the things that I said were perfect about it before, apparently it wasn't because there was better because it managed to get better. Cool. But hey, so Alan Zelda, where are you at? Um, I'm at a point. I've got some pictures. I need to figure out where they were taken. Okay, I oh, see so you pretty early. Yeah, cause, but this is, I guess, this is the problem with it: the fact that, like, you're saying about like, when I said where you pushing at, through, oh, but I meant more emotionally. Oh, <laughs> but I mean, emotionally, the the only reason I would continue playing it at this point is because it's one of the most expensive games I've ever bought that wasn't a special edition. So I feel like I have to I have to get my money's worth. That's the gambler's fallacy. Don't fall for that shit. But it's like I'm. I, I got to a point in it where it's just like I. I wasn't enjoying being in the world and I wasn't enjoying like trying to figure out what direction to go in and like having not really having any general direction of where to go what missions to do like trying to find where locations for these pictures are and then wandering into an area realizing the enemies in that area are beyond me so I'm like all right I'll go in the other random direction and just <laughs> and then just realizing I don't want to just walk in every direction until I come across something that's not ridiculous. That kind of is a path if you follow the objectives they're meant to be leading you through uh, but that's the point the like beginning. I was trying like looking at the object like using this as an, an objective in air quotes of like finding these pictures and just being like well I think one of them was over there and then wandering over and being like yeah no, oh okay so era. for like, me getting those pictures was I went for the pictures when I was in the area where I thought they were hmm. but also because I wasn't I didn't. Ha- I I couldn't get the locations of those pictures up because I turned off like objective so you, markers. So, so, so I had to say, that I'm, that, okay. I'm for not- the listeners that may be confused at this point, there's a, a kind of mechanic in the game which is that by by finding where particular photos have been taken, um, Link is able to regain his memories, and you get cutscenes of these memories at that time. Um, and this is really where the story of the game like is in a, a very large part fed to you um and that they're quite interesting um but you do actually have to find the specific location and that involves and it's quite a good mechanic because of it because it involves like actually recognizing the environment like getting a real sense of the shape of the land and yeah like just seeing trying to spot landmarks in those pictures and thinking about the angle that the that the, the, the picture, picture must have been yeah. taken from because of that. Yeah. And I think I think that's really clever. I think that actually gets you to be a lot more involved with an open world than a lot of open world mechanics do. Um, but at the same time, I can entirely understand your frustration. I spent a lot of hours just wandering off in one direction, trying to find the first one of those so that I felt like I had yeah. a, a kind I've, of handle on that. I found a couple of them fairly quickly. Mm. just certain oh, landmarks really? and just being like all right that's that should be roughly over there that should be roughly over there but then it then it was like i think that's over there and then wandering in and just being like oh there's two ro- giant robots here i've never fought these I mean, before I've, i found i found two oh, of dude, them so you far. should yeah you should not be near guardians but yeah it's, that's the thing it's just sort of like that was my, the- it's like this you know in the whole thing of just again because i don't know if they're because i've turned off objective markers predominantly except for on the map I you know I can't see where if they it does tell you where the pictures are. So for me, it's just sort of like looking at the pictures, thinking what's nearest to me, and that just happened to be near me. It was just in a direction the game didn't want me to go at that point. But there's so so my experience of tangling with guardians has been kind of excellent at this point because I I have I can't I don't I can't do shit to them right, but I wandered off the beaten path because I because there was a a tower that looked like it was within range and I was like well I've got this far there's nothing else that I can uh, like quick uh, do a quick transport to around here so I might as well go to that tower mm. and on my way in it's fucking surrounded by guardians can't touch them I had I just had to like fucking sneak like I had never snuck before See, then, like crouched I'm, down I in the I wouldn't grass. be surprised if this is the same place I went to <laughs> where I just walked in and they were just patrolling this big area it's like <laughs> and I, was just right I also there. know exactly the tower that you're talking it about Hyrule did it. Field right uh, yeah 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 I yeah, fucking yeah, did yeah. it and it was great because it, because I because if I fucked up I knew I was going to die but yeah, I just had waiting like one for that of... beep where you do the jump right <laughs> yeah. up the tower yeah <laughs> do, 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 do. jump <laughs> yeah, I did, I tried. It was like one attempt to sneak past them, and I was like, I, I can't bother with this yeah. right now. I I don't know, but yeah, it's just I'm generally yeah. My feeling of the game is I 
right now i don't i it's annoying because after your conversation about it it sounded like this game sounds amazing i really want to play this and get into this and then after playing it for a few hours i was like no yeah it sounds it sounds so much like exactly where i was with it though like Mm -hmm. listening to your complaints about it is like listening to past me (laughs) <laughs> yeah like literally I mean you can go back you remember those episodes where I talked about it and I was just like I just don't understand and now it just makes me sound like I've drunk the fucking Kool-Aid <laughs> but like I, I think it's amazing like and I I think your options are either stick with it or realise that where you are and what Zelda is offering I, I, I just like not compatible right now and yeah. you need to move on play something else and then realign your feelings about it. But I spent, what, like nine months last year getting myself into a position where I felt like it was something that I could revisit. Do and you, it was fucking worth it. Like, Joe, you do realise that you're saying to Alan that what he needs to do to be able to enjoy Zelda is change himself. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I, <laughs> yeah, Just like how I changed myself to be so able to play Zelda. I could accept Zelda into my life. <laughs> And this is how the cult of the trifles was born. Because <laughs> we could all do with being a little bit more Zelda. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, I think we should have a break, man. What do you think, guys? <laughs> I mean, like, if, we, if we're done talking about Kingdom Come Deliverance. <laughs> I, I, yeah, let's, can, let's put a pin in Kingdom Come I, Deliverance. I'll revisit. Oh, is there something you want, you want to ask? If you want to ask, Yeah, ask. I guess, I think I do. Because okay. it, feels, it feels like we've had like a, a kind of, a talk of like the, the trials and pitfalls of this game and like some of the kind of like understanding of the vision. But, uh, I don't know, like, no, I, I think I need a little bit more of that vision. What What is it that you feel like the game is trying to be I that feel isn't like succeeding the, at being? I feel like the game is trying to create a really to a full replication of a kind of person inserted into medieval life. Except I think it's actually, do you remember when we talked earlier and we were talking about that kind of mountain blade sim stuff? Mm -hmm. I actually think that that stuff isn't, I've seen no evidence to suggest that I could stop what I was doing and become a farmer. Mm -hmm. Right. So far, that's not something that's like, I'm being filled. I I feel like I'm being fielded in very much a combat orientated, like, you know, desire to avenge the wrongs yeah like it's putting me on a path and there is a main quest line that is pulling me through it it's not very i don't feel like it's ambiently trying to make me figure that out i feel very directed um but i but like i said before it's so difficult to kind of i feel like i'm almost trying to explain certain systems that maybe won't exist you know, like, it, but it's like, but certain things like, you know, money is super valuable. And I don't mean in an RPG sense, like money is hard to come by, you know, like if you, if you find a dead body that is going to have a coin on it, it's not going to have 50, you know, like, and there's a really in-depth haggling system, which seems to have built, been built quite a lot out of the uh, Witcher contracts system. Does it, does it feel know? like it manages to, when it is working properly, uh, create and maintain an authenticity to the time that it's supposed to be portraying that you haven't experienced in it in other video games because that's what I think about yeah. when you talk about m- money actually being valuable yes like I, I do believe that that's what's going on I also though believe that I'm so early on in the game that then you know there's always that late late game economy break isn't there oh, and yeah. I need to and um, before I can like sit down and say that that definitely is what's going on. I need to fucking know that because the, if there's that midpoint break, that might happen. Like once I've got better armor and got better stuff, if I can kill guys that have nice armor and then sell them for big money, then I'm like, you know, I'm sorted. And that would actually be rubbish. Mm-hmm. Like with the tone that they're going for. But right now what I know is that I've got 25 coins like like I, I can't remember what the what the currency is called Groat, Groat something like that <laughs> but I've, I've got I've got 25 of them and I know a lockpick costs 18 
And I've been pretty happily there for a little while. And if you can do the maths on kind of a, that kind of economy, like via things like Skyrim, that's kind of where I'm at mm-hmm. with it. You know, like those kind of bare level resources are a lot of money in the early game, mm-hmm. at least. And that, I Does mean, it, like if I bought, I mean, I'm not going to buy any fucking lot picks because that'd be a waste of my fucking cash. But hey. Does it feel like the. Does it feel like the kind of RPG element isn't in the the numbers and statistics, but is actually in terms of you role playing and getting to grips with the systems of the game? A bit of both. It's per, but I, and I think that this is maybe a strength, but because it's so slow at showing its hand, I feel like I am five hours into it. I feel like I am still in the tutorial, mm-hmm. right? Um, I've only just seen the um, the introductory credits, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. From what I can see, I think it's a much more perks-based system, right? So it's about accruing experience that you get for doing different actions. Within those actions, kind of like Oblivion, you get better at it. So it's all about, like, so if I'm running around picking flowers, my herbalism skill is going up, right? Right. Um, if I'm like, uh, I'm, if just, I'm, fighting, I'm just enjoying the idea of like this this orphaned fucking medieval dude just running around picking flowers in a field. D- dude, you don't know how long I was doing that because I was like, I don't know what to do or where to go or how to be a person in this world right now. Well, I know how to upgrade my herbalism skill. I guess I'll just pick these flowering mushrooms until I've got a whole bunch of them and then I'm going to eat them all at once and see what happens. Because like, that's but, but, cause that's what I do in real life. I mean, like, <laughs> let's be honest. But but now now you're talking about a man who's just seen his parents die who's like completely incapable of coping and has just and run off and picked sh- got loads of drugs. Pick, <laughs> got to take loads of drugs and pick flowers in the wind. Because that's how I would deal with it, right? So, you know, like, that's, that's the thing. Like... You'll find me bogkinless running through the fucking forests, <laughs> screaming. <laughs> but like, I was thinking of maybe taking all of those drugs and then seeing what happens if I engage in the main storyline. <laughs> like that might be the thing. Because apparently I've got to maintain getting into a noble district. And I want to see if I can do that off my fucking nut. <laughs> yeah, fucking noble. Yeah, like, I've, got to go to no- I've got to go to a noble party, but like eating raw mushrooms and like rocking up to that. Do you think you can spike the soup with the fly Garrick? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Who's playing, bruv? Who's on the loop, man? This just sounds fucking good, bruv. <laughs> Taste my game face. So, Alan, obviously, we've been more and more interested in what's going on in the universe of the Switch of late. So, you've been playing, um, like, one of the... A game that, I've, uh, that I think I mentioned before is something that should have come to Switch and has come to Switch and is being very, very successful on Switch, which is Stardew Valley. Mm. So, how's Stardew Valley? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start off with a little story. I, so, I always like a little story. A little story. A little lead-in. So... Pro- maybe about 15 years ago by this point. Fuck me, Alan. Is it that long ago? It might have been. Maybe just shy of 15 <laughs> years. Um, okay. There was there was a time where I think Joe was pretty much living at my house <laughs> yeah. for like a week. And at that point, I'd rented a copy of Harvest Moon on the GameCube. And I'd set up a shop with like a, it's like a big TV that wasn't my own in my bedroom. And I was playing harvest moon and i'd printed out sheets and sheets of information about how different crops what time they should be planted and all the different recipes and stuff yes. like that all of our activities that week were planned around alan's harvest moon <laughs> <laughs> schedule but we can't have a party then that's when the crops are coming in i don't come on it wasn't that bad <laughs> no it wasn't that bad <laughs> Yeah, you but, just left the party to go and get that dealt with. I swear you did. Yeah, probably. <laughs> but like, I, I from then, I was always just my my impression of that time was just like, yeah, I was just playing. I was mean, it wasn't anything, you know. It was fun. I enjoyed like the you know the town of people, the the fact that it was. The part I always think back to with Harvest Moon is the fact that it's like a mini open world where every character has like a house and a routine and 
when you know a job and you build your relationships with all these people and it's sort of like it's and then murder min- them in their sleep no <laughs> they're best friends but it was like a mini version of what i want every open world to be where there aren't just random npcs they all have a semi-purpose or at least like even if you don't talk to them they're doing something that they feel like complete autonomous individuals rather yeah. than just something that's there for the player to have something to fight or yeah. murder in their sleep exactly <laughs> but so but my remembering of that was like that's why i was playing it the farming stuff was like yeah all right i'm just doing it just to push the story through i'm fully addicted to stardew valley <laughs> and all i do is farm <laughs> stardew valley right stodgy valley looks amazing though <laughs> Like it, it looks like this wonderful. And I, I, I don't have it, but I've been very, very tempted because it looks like this wonderful game that's just about fucking chilling out and growing some crops. That yeah. like, if you've had enough of a fucking stressful day at work, just plant some fucking radishes. <laughs> like, yeah, why the fuck not? You know, <laughs> got got in an argument with your parents, your partner, just go and harvest some wheat. Like, yeah, you can do it on the toilet. <laughs> I have, I think. <laughs> coming round <laughs> nice get them switches on the toilet <laughs> but I mean I guess to to say like the the outline of the game generally is that I mean it's a semi top down pixel art farming simulation so game. it's not isometric it's not a a, a 45 it's not it's not facing Wayne <laughs> yeah, it's not facing Wayne but it's all made by one guy. I think his name is Eric Barone, but um, it's like published by the com- company that did Starbound. But it's a British developer, British publisher. Um, and and um, actually, like after after the initial release of the game, um, the publisher has had other people working on it, other than that one guy. Mm. But like, it was it was one person that was working on it for like seven years or something. It might be longer. Yeah, um, but he predominantly. I mean, actually, he's currently running the wiki. He created and built the official wiki for the game himself. <laughs> it's it's he's never done with Star Trek no, Valley. It's a really good wiki. <laughs> <laughs> but so the but the outline of it is that you are, uh, I guess, a young man who has got a shit job in the city, pressing buttons at a computer. Your grandfather passes away, and you are given the farm. You take the farm in, in the inheritance. So you decide to quit your shitty job, move out to the country and build up this farm back to glory because you get there and it's just covered in just like trees and rocks and grass and stuff. And so the entire thing needs sort of clearing out and building up again. And it's one of those games that even just that element of it, I found myself losing hours of just like clearing the rocks and trees from my plot of land so that I could plant some crops. And I think I'm getting quite into like... (laughs) So I feel really vindicated a little bit because the thing is, is Alan's fought this a lot. But whenever I hear the words Harvest Moon, I think of Alan and have for ages. And I really love that it's come back round for you. (laughs) Yeah, it really has. Um, I think... For a game to manage to be satisfying in such kind of low-key tasks actually involves a lot of careful design and for it to for it to be satisfying at the same time rather than just feel compelling or possibly addicting, then the it it takes it takes like very careful thinking to really manage to make a yeah. experience there that's enjoyable to do. And when fucking the, the fact of the matter is, I know that the, that this one guy has been making it for so long, and that the reason that he made it is because he was like, "Harvest Moon was great. We need more of that. <laughs> yeah. We're not having more of that, so I'm going to sort it out." Like it just it just makes me feel good about the world of video <laughs> games that he went there and he did that. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I think it's it's like success. As well, like it's I, I like if you're all invested into video games media, every outlet has a person <laughs> that is obsessed with Stardew Valley. Alan, you're ours. Yeah, you know. And apparently, but apparently so. one of the things that you were talking about, like, was your kind of story, like, setup for it, which actually sounds like something that's had a little bit more kind of thought 
put into it than your harvest moons would there's a lot more even just outside of some of the i guess the different elements of what's going on there's just more interesting stuff happening that i wouldn't have expected there to happen like after the first year of being in this town there's a random new person that's arrived and you find out that it's the the whoa, whoa, whoa. You might be wandering into spoilers. No, no, it's, it's really not because it's like it's after year one, and there's this is like a lifetime of game or whatever. But it's like the the military husband of one of the women in the town who's been gone for ages. So, but whenever you talk to him, he's just like, "You probably know my son better than I know him. I really don't know what to do." Like one of the missions is. Can like I really want to get my wife something good for our anniversary. Like, can you can you get me this thing? But it's there's just a sense of just like he's like, oh man, I really want of being home is weird, and I really want my relationship with my wife and my family to be better. Fuck, <laughs> and that's but that kind of thing is just sort of happening throughout the story, and it's like Harvest Moon never did this. <laughs> Does it uh, go so <laughs> again? Not yet. Okay. So, <laughs> I I don't know. We'll so, see what happens. So this is this is something that I that I feel happens a lot to different degrees with kind of indie games that are born of the of a love for like old school games of whatever variety. Like the the video games that people make because they like the Nintendo games. They mm. and and I suppose this kind of ties nicely with the conversation we we're having before because we f- we feel like Nintendo could be doing more with their stories possibly. Um but when the community that loves those games takes them and tries to make them their own, they do that. And I mean, it's to go back to Celeste again, it's what makes Celeste part of what makes Celeste so amazing. And it really fucking doubles down on that and mm. is heartbreaking because of it. And that is so much more than you expect from that game, possibly because of the kind of preconceptions that you have from the genre as was. Mm. So it's, it's always a, it's always a very pleasant surprise when you realise that the people that are making it have more of an understanding of what the genre could be than just trying to reproduce something. Yeah. And I, I still feel like I've only reached the tip of the iceberg with a lot of the story stuff that's going on in it. There's, I don't know how many years in game there are. It might be endless, but you know, I was kind of almost at my end of second year in the game and there's, yeah, it's still sort of like seeing the different evolving relationships of not just you with the people in the town, but the pe- the other people in the town with each other is just more than I would expect. And like the fact that a lot of your missions end up tying into their characters far more than just I need this random thing. Like the, there's a woman there that's an alcoholic and the first mi- oh, thing she asks you to do is make her some beer. It's fucking <laughs> That's the thing though. That's the other aspect of it is one of the things that I've learned is we've taken these ideas from these Nintendo games and then we've added onto them our like our generation's own insecurities and broken ways that we deal with life and I think that comes much more from growing with them yeah actually you know? growing with the games yeah, yeah like so that so that we're using these as kind of ciphers for our own experiences and stuff like that which I think is super interesting but Alan I have a couple of questions okay. about about Stardew Valley I, I really want to know about like the farming, right? I want to know. I know. I want to know what you got. What's your What's your bestest crop? Do you have animals? What's going on in the farm, Alan? Your farm. <laughs> <laughs> so the the way the farming works is, um, you'll I guess more stereotypically, you'll clear a plot of land, um, you'll hoe the land, you'll plant <laughs> some seeds. Maybe you've put some fertilizer in there to help it <coughs> along, and there'll be different crops that grow different times of year. So you'd be like, you can plant something that. Can, do you, do you have to keep your fields on a, in a crop rotation? Do you, do you have to make sure that the the soils are appropriately nitrified? Oh, I mean, in some ways, I mean uh, the, the way that the <laughs> that's you the I was expecting. <laughs> I mean, just just in the idea of like, if you plant fertilizer, that is for a specific type of fertilizer, and you're like, okay, I need this type of plant in this state, so I'm going to have to put it on these specific areas that I put this type of fertilizer. Um, so that's stuff you do have to keep in in mind but um, I do have animals yeah what have you got uh, so I've got there's the the coop 
which I've got up to the the second level. You can, I think you. So you've got like a the regular one, uh, a a double size one, and then a deluxe one that you unlock over time. So every time you level up your coop, do you just say to yourself, "Fucking cooped up, cooped up, mate." <laughs> But and that's so in there. I've got like a bunch of chickens, a couple of ducks. Oh, you got ducks! Got ducks, and they all like one of the elements with all the animals is that they all have a happiness level. So and that is built up by like if you leave them outside to eat, have the normal grass rather than just leaving them inside and having hay, they're happier. If you go and pet them, that builds up their happiness. So you just sort of like do that every morning. Are like, you a free hey. range guy? Oh hell yeah! Oh nice. It's, it's the only. Can way. you give them names like Mister Quacktastic? You can. I mean, you can name them anything <laughs> you want. They do give you like a a randomized name thing for the animals that you can just click the little dice icon and it will just keep rolling over until you find something fun name but. all of your pigs baby bacon that way you won't be unhappy when you have to slaughter them I can you have one yet. can you have one dog called Mr. Quacktastic for me yes I will do that. <laughs> and then also got a barn spin a couple of cows a couple of goats you can also get a horse that becomes like your mode of transportation around the area but I, I need more resources for that but then there's also you start building up ways of sort of automating stuff like building sprinklers and um one of the things that i actually find the most interesting about the game i guess going into some of the more weird fantasy elements that are going on in it there's there's a wizard in a tower that you go and have a chat with when you first start the game and he says i'm going to take you over to this old rundown community center and you go to this community center, it's all like, it's, it's practically in ruins, like no one wants to go there. But there's a bunch of forest spirits living there. And fucking hippies. Every, all of the, <laughs> the spirits there, you can, you essentially give them like gift packages of certain items. And each room has a different selection of packages that you can give them. Some of it might be like, oh, we want a bunch of um, like spring plants, a bunch of fall plants, a bunch of things from foraging, whatever. And as you complete those different packages, which take a while, all of the rooms then become rejuvenated by the the spirits. A sort of like an overarching task for you to do throughout the entire game. So it's like this random thing that's going to take you a while to figure out how to make is one of them. And it forces you to try out everything and figure out how to do all, make all of the different things and get all the different animals and stuff. And that kind of sounds amazing. It's like over here, I've got my like alcoholic, I've got my marine, and over here, that like, studio Ghibli is going on. Yeah, like it sounds mad. Yeah. <laughs> like the but spread. Then there's also an adventurers guild in town, <laughs> and next to the adventurers guild, there's the old mine, and it's essentially like a survival thing where you go into the mines. Part of it will just be to mining like your ores, like your coppers and your iron and that sort of stuff. The other part is fighting all the monsters in the mines and going down and down the levels of the mine. Wait, what? There's Diablo in this? <laughs> yeah. What? So you'll keep going down the levels of the mine. Every five levels, you unlock an elevator point so you can go back to that point later. <sighs> Temple of Elemental Evil. Every 10 levels, you get a little chest that gives you a nice new item. Sometimes it's a nice fancy sword. Other or, times, is it some sort of like spectacular rake? <laughs> or is rakes. it always combat? <laughs> I've got some really nice boots. Oh, okay. But you kind of you keep working your way down, and they all as you go down. I think I can't remember how many levels it is. Like I'm at about ninety something at the moment, and it's still going. <sighs> but it's all of the levels. Kind of slowly, you'll get. It's like different types of ores. Like if you want to get gold, you've got to go pretty far down. But then also the enemy types are becoming more difficult and more interesting. So it starts off with just little slimes and bats. And then slowly it's sort of like weird shadow creatures. Are there bosses? I haven't fought any bosses. So okay. I don't know if there There might be one at the very bottom though. So oh, who knows? Okay. One of the things I'm getting from this is that I... Because I've heard a lot about people enjoying Stardew Valley, but very little about why it's good, right? And right now, hearing this, it sounds like fucking variety is the order of the day, yeah. right? And that's that's amazing. I feel like I've got another fucking Switch game that I've got to play. This is <laughs> yeah. fucking great, man. What are you saying? <laughs> I know. No, I'm, I think I think I'm getting it. Yeah, I think I'm getting it. Like because 
It's genuine. Like I've lost so much time to it, and it's definitely it's as we say about games that you sort of like. The Switch to me is a perfect thing for like I want to play something while I'm watching TV. I want to pick up something for five minutes on my lunch break, and because it's all these little bite-sized things that you can accomplish, I just I'll jump in, I'll do some plants, I'll jump in, I'll do a few levels of the mine, like, and it you always feel accomplished because it's always working towards something like, Oh, I'm going to go to the hidden bit of the forest and get some hardwood while fighting off some slimes so that I can then use that hardwood to is building up so I can get the better barn later so I can get more animals. And then that can give me better, like different types of milk to make different types of cheeses to then use that to upgrade the community center, which then when that's all fully done, I don't know what happens then. (laughs) I guess the community start using it and everyone's a bit happier maybe. But it's there's so much going on and every time I start they there are moments where I'm just sort of playing it and I'm like man there's so much here. One guy made this. How the fuck did one guy do it all of this? It took him forever. It just took him forever yeah. and, he, and he kept he kept st- uh, kind of delaying it because there was a, instead of appropriately bug fixing the things that he needed to do he'd have a new idea and then he'd just put it in feature creep is just the thing that propelled that game mm. and therefore Surprised. there's just loads and loads of fucking game um because i, and I the, mean, didn't even talk about the like there are you know events that happen like each season has one or two special events or like, like a festival had, vibes. yeah like a bunch of different festivals they're like every character every member of the town has a birthday on on a calendar so you can go and look at the calendar it will just give you what events happening in the birthdays every character has likes and dislikes and then also depending on if you give when you give them a a certain item it will mean more or less to them and like you can your actions in the town can affect your relationships with certain people in there and it's there's just so much (laughs) so much who's do you know if the multiplayer is in it yet? Because nope. I know there was an update very, very recently. As far as I know, it's still something happening. Okay. It's at least on maybe being better tested on PC. Well, there's a multiplayer too. What is going on? They're bringing in like a four player <laughs> co op. Is work that- together to build your farm. Yeah. So like, so the reason that it took a really long time to come out was because he he said that there was going to be multiplayer in it. And he just having to deal with getting his head around netcode meant that he, he never made it. Um, so the game was released without the multiplayer, but the but the reason that the publisher got more people in to work on it was to bug fix and to make the multiplayer. Okay. Um, so I think it, I guess it's it's very, very close to coming out. Yeah. I thought it might have already come out already. So I've, so seen there some, is I've be, definitely yeah. seen screenshots of the multiplayer set up. So, we, so if we all get it, we could play it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Taste my game face farm. <laughs> yes. Taste my farm face. <laughs> taste my farm face. Excellent. Ta- taste my radish face. <laughs> taste my corn face. <laughs> taste my Mr. Quacktastic face. <laughs> just make a coop full of... Mr. Quacktastic. <laughs> oh. Or just one whole coop just for him. Oh, you see, yeah, and... But this is the thing, right? Like this is this is a game that is that has come together because of somebody's love for a Nintendo game on the GameCube, and or well, before, older, before than older than that, we're yeah. talking Game Boy Color. Oh, oh yeah. my bad, my bad. Or actually, you talked, you talked about playing on the GameCube. I, yeah, I played yeah. the GameCube. This one of Super them. Nintendo is the first one Fuck, that I'm that conscious of. Yeah, oh my god, yeah, I didn't yeah, even yeah. know. Yeah. Um, it's, I, it's like, like big, I feel like I feel like it's only been something that's that I've been aware of in like the video game zeitgeist, like within actually within my time of being aware of the video game zeitgeist. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like the thing is, is um, Harvest Moon is actually it really had its flashpoint, like that the GameCube title. I I kind of feel is like the that was the last one that was like moderately successful yeah. right like 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 mm-hmm. big style that's the last one i remember there being any sort of fanfare about yeah. existing mm-hmm. and i think there were interesting things that happened in the other harvest moons but like they kind of they kind of mucked around with they had dalliances with other ideas like rpg so elements was, and stuff like there that there was a thing that happened with it though that 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 gamecube one that i played was the last one that the core developer of the franchise worked on and it was taken away from them by the publisher, given to another team who didn't quite Understand get it right. It. Yeah. I think the original developer did start working on a new franchise, but I'm not sure what happened with that exactly. Mm-hmm. But yeah. And just- but this is clearly somebody who 
does understand it mm. and has done their very fucking hardest to make sure that they create something that is of not just the same quality but manages to improve on it in some really significant ways yeah so um, apparently another fucking switch game that we all have to get oh yeah. fuck man i've got to get a hold of that bigger like sd card <laughs> like this I, that's becoming apparent I got rapidly. Yesterday. <laughs> okay <laughs> rapidly yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, that was a day one investment for me because I, yeah. just, I just knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, like, the the possible Switch must buy that I've been putting some time into lately has been Darkest Dungeon. So um, jealous. Yeah. Um, it's, so, like, Darkest Dungeon is a um, Lovecraftian um, turn-based... Um, tactical roguelike, I suppose. Um, you are. Oh, it's got this beautiful fucking intro that has just is wonderfully overwritten. It, like talks of um, uh, antediluvian horrors and um, just. It, whoever wrote it clearly had a fucking thesaurus next to them <laughs> just looking for words that meant ancient and terrible and like got really fucking stuck in um, and it's it's got all of this thick drama to it that just it's it's as Lovecraftian as anything gets like in all of the right ways and it has this crisp art style that's like uh, these quite cartoonish characters that are full of kind of harsh angular edges and it just has this kind of turn of the century in the dirt like drinking whiskey to tide from the fucking terrible things that you've seen or the memories of the terrible things that you've seen <laughs> so that you're not driven insane by them whilst really you are being driven completely fucking <laughs> mad um and <laughs> and what you do in the game is you're the <laughs> the offspring of somebody who's run away from a manor where this the, what do they call it the the opulent and imperial manor um where they've they've dug deeper into its secrets and found that there's some portal to a nether dimension where horrible demons have come tearing forth and you're trying to take it back and you're trying to take it back by putting together a team of fucking ragtag fucked up like adventurers to go on missions into it to try and t find whatever relics of your ancestors you can to develop the surrounding village so that you can eventually build up enough power to close I mean I assume because I haven't played it that much to close whatever terrible portal it is or to defeat what what horrifying Cthulhu-esque nether beast lies at the heart of the manor now and and it's it's just totally really really good <laughs> Um, it's it's all about and, and like this is a kick no not a Kickstarter funded thing but um uh, maybe it is I can't remember but an early access thing that's been around for a while and I mean for for people that are listening that are like in involved in the gaming universe at large I'm sure you would have heard of it already um but for the people that haven't it's like the it it's kind of happened in stages um on, on its initial um release early access release there was a lot of hype for it um people were really interested in the systems um they kind of enjoyed the balance that occurred because of certain ways that the systems worked in that you could only attack people that were at the front of your group of four or the group of four enemies that you're facing and the developers changed that around because they didn't like how that meant that people were trying to game the game um and that had a negative effect in terms of the it's community support for it because pretty people, big backlash yeah yeah people that have been playing it for a while were like no we like it how it is but frankly i i didn't get it in early access be well, because i really do and i'm very very glad that they've changed it because it means that you have what feels like quite a dynamic balance to consider um with your with your squad of four there's a lot of different options that you have and all of them are all of them feel like wars of attrition you are slowly trying to stop yourself from getting too beaten up by every scrap that you get into but better than that you're you're trying to slowly stop yourself from going mad as well 
every fight that you go into makes you more stressed you have a resource which is the torches that you carry into like the 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 basements and the the caves that lie underneath this this manor and as you as the light goes down you get more and more stressed and as and there are certain enemies that don't attack your physical self they attack your mind and they make you go more and more mad and that war of attrition is something that doesn't exist mission by mission even because when you leave that manor you have that stress with you and you have to manage your resources so that you can provide the things to each of your party members that they need to de-stress so that's either spending time in the uh, in like the temple like meditating or praying or self-flagellating because that is the only way that they feel that they can appease their conscience or going to the tavern and like gambling or whoring away the next week <laughs> so that they can find some sort of peace because that's the thing that's always fascinated me about this game like I'm I've been really looking forward to getting it and you know how I am with this like fucking physical copy thing that I'm on. And I know that for the first time ever at the end of March, it's coming out in a physical copy and that's when I want to get it. But um, we've talked about it at length before about why, why have we not got this game? Like, mm-hmm. why is this a game we're not playing? Because I've always seen it as this kind of like management of push, right? Like you've got these this group of adventurers and it's all about how far you're willing to break them and is that something that's stuff that we've talked about about it does that a feeling that you get through the game is it about that or is it just about expending them till they're done it's it's about trying to it feels like it's about trying to p- p- hold them back from the brink because every time you get to a certain amount of stress they end up developing an extra negative trait like it could be um i've got one character that i've been particularly aggravated by the fact that she's got a trait called unquiet mind which means that she can't meditate now to relieve some of that stress and on the flip side one of her good abilities is she's a meditator so she gets extra she so she loses more stress from meditating than anything else <laughs> but now she's got unquiet mind she can't do that but there's so you broke her it's why I, I, the f- <laughs> I, I broke her i mean yeah i guess <laughs> I'd, I'd i'd say that it was the fucking untold it's terrors the one she loved. <laughs> so it was the untold terrors that she was facing in mortal combat but Who i mean i sent her, her down there <laughs> Um, you said don't come back <laughs> till it's fucking done <laughs> um, but I mean the the there's so many things going on in here um the the kind of the the ways that they the ways that they de-stress is is kind of key to it but um the the fucking character classes are really interesting as well like it's not your standard kind of fighter wizard rogue universe like it's you've got you you do have like your your crusader like holy knight types um which which fits because they're fighting unholy terrors but you've also got like flagellants and you've got like a uh, a kind of um I can't remember what the class is but but it's, it's somebody that's wearing like um a, a kind of black death like a plague uh, doctor mask, a plague yeah. doctor mask. Yeah, that I've seen. Like, that, to be honest, that's the image that I think of when I think well, about this game. He's so he's so striking in the art design. I, I, yeah, is it, he's one of them secret plushies that I want. <laughs> I mean, no, but I don't even think that's the best thing though, because you've I mean, you've got highwaymen that you can hire to fight for. You've got like a. Uh, the guy that turns up with a pack of dogs that you can that, that he can sick on like these fucking terrible demons from another dimensions like it's it's this it is it is the darkest of dark fantasy it like sits in that particular i mean i'm trying to use the vocabulary at every turn to describe it as best i can because it is so invested in that particular kind of like law of of fantasy like it is it is as lovecraftian as lovecraftian eldritch as fuck eldritch (laughs) is shit (laughs) yes um and 
and it fucking delivers. And and the thing is, because because it's a roguelike, because it's procedurally generated, I thought that what I would find is that as I played it, that stuff kind of wore away. But it has this nice thing of having the a kind of constant narration. Oh, not a constant narration, but an interspersed narration that adds exactly the right amount of additional flavour for you to feel like you're fully consumed by that all of the time. It's quite a stressful game to play. I can imagine. But in the best way. Yeah. In the best way. Like, and, and the fact that it's turn-based means that you, although you are presented with having to deal with those, all of that, all of the horror of the scenario, you aren't forced to do so quickly and therefore you can pace things at a sensible rate. The, the flip is, I don't have anywhere near enough fucking money to be able to keep pulling off any sorts of missions at the moment though. Like, there's there's three difficulties they suggest you should play it on the easiest one to start with. I was a fool and was like, no, I'm fucking schooled. I'll play it on the normal <laughs> difficulty. I don't think this campaign's going to last very long. <laughs> okay. But the thing is, I guess the, the telling question is, is when you do like fall out of this campaign, are you going to jump straight back in? I don't, I don't know. I'm going to have to see how it goes. Okay. I suspect the answer is yes, but there's one fucking fatal flaw in the game design, which is really, really annoying. Um, and I think it's, I think it's some pe- I think it's something that people should definitely know about before they get the game, because it might be a deal breaker for you, which is for whatever reason, the way they've made the engine means that they cannot change the font size and particularly on the switch particularly on portable mode the the font is tiny i mean like although i wear glasses i have i'm short-sighted and i have pretty decent eyesight and i'm having to hold that thing about a foot from my face to be able to see the smaller text and there is a lot of text in it and i think for most people that have played the game for a decent amount of time, they've just kind of memorised what things mean what. But as I'm starting out, and as I really am interested and in, invested in the lore of the game, like, there's a lot of, like, eye squinting, what the fuck does this tiny little bit of text say kind of a vibe. So it's kind of obfuscating itself a it little is, bit. Yeah. It is. Um, and there's mods for it on PC to stop that from happening, because, it, I mean, it's even a problem there on larger screens. But... Oh. Um, but at the same time, engine problem again. So the the mods have to be updated each time there's a big update. And every time there's an update, it stops the mods working. And it means that I think they've fallen behind a bit as well. So yeah, technical aggravation there. I really hope, because I know this game came out on Vita as well, but I hope with the popularity that, that it's gaining on the Switch, it will encourage them to deal with that. But so far, even though it came out on the Vita, the developer hasn't like tried to tangle with that yet mm. so we'll see yeah I mean like the sales that you'll get on the Switch per the Vita they were probably staggeringly uh, oh, different indeed. <laughs> yeah indeed but um, but I'm absolutely certain you're going to love it Jay excellent um, <laughs> and another game for my Switch <laughs> <laughs> just sandwich between like <laughs> arguments for more games that I should buy and the one I brought to the table today don't bother <laughs> not right now no well, it's not on the Switch though, so that's no that's true enough. that's true because you know you guys play Switch games now <laughs> while I don't that's, I'm just <laughs> bucking it I'm just going games. the other way <laughs> I can't go up my stairs to my PC at the moment so it's all, it's all I can do that's my excuse it's all I can do <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> don't pretend like you don't fucking love it. Yeah, you mean you're not fucking wrong. <laughs> you're not fucking wrong. Um, but yeah, but I mean, I. <sighs> you know what? After after we finish recording, I'm just going to show you the intro to the game because, right. like, it's just it's thick with the right atmosphere. <laughs> so, like, yeah, if if this sounds like it might be for you, dear listener, have a look at the trailer. Like, cause I mean, if you're, if you're into <laughs> the kind of the horrifying torment that only H.P. Lovecraft manages to bring to bring into focus, well, it's not only H.P. Lovecraft that can bring it into focus, <laughs> because the guys that made Dark, uh, Darkest Dungeon are about that too. And we'll be having this out again at the beginning of April once I've managed to get a touch to it as well. So fucking a. Fair enough. Switch for life and all that. <laughs> Taste my switch. <laughs> the new name of the podcast. Is that pod? Yeah. I are we podded? So. We're fully podded. I reckon so. I've had a good time recording this pod. This I have to. I've got, I must admit, I've got quite drunk whilst we were recording this one. 
I think I think I've kind of wandered off on more tangents than I intended to. Hopefully, everything still stayed in that's some okay. sort of focus. It's been a nice little. It's been a, a free person cozy pod today, so you know that's all good. I like you when we do this thing. <laughs> like a bum. But hey, um, so anyway, if you have enjoyed this podcast, as always, do recommend this to anybody who, who you think might also enjoy it. Um, we we want to kind of branch out our listenership, but we don't want people trying to peddle off some people who aren't who aren't interested in video games. <laughs> Though those motherfuckers need to learn. Um, but, um, yeah, if you think anybody might might be interested, do do point us in their direction or them in our direction. Um, if you do want to get in contact with this, um, you could send us an email to taste my game face at gmail dot com. Uh, we we have so far received what like three, three emails so we but we read them we promise <laughs> and we really want more <laughs> Um, or, or you could uh, um, uh, tweet us at Taste My Game Face, um, or you can find us uh, on Facebook um, at Taste My Game Face as well. Um, just yep. fucking Google us, and we turn up everywhere. <laughs> YouTube. We've even got our own website, um, <laughs> which is Taste My Game Face at Gmail. Uh, not that, that's a fucking. <laughs> I told you I was drunk. Um, <laughs> Taste My Game Face dot Taste My Game Face dot com. <laughs> that that much simpler. <laughs> much simpler. <And laughs> if everyone that listens to this subscribes to the YouTube and then <laughs> recommends more, then we can be youtube.com slash taste my game face. And oh. that be all of the things. All of We're the almost things. there. We're Are almost there. there. I feel like we've made a terrible mistake in not making our website taste my game face dot ninja. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we remedy that? I mean, we can make it an option. <laughs> <laughs> So There's always a way to add a reader. So, so in the near future, you can also find us uh, taste my game face dot ninja. <laughs> yeah, but not yet. Not? But not not yet. yet. <laughs> All right. Um, so that was episode seventy of Taste My Game Face. I've been this is the Eddie. I've been Joe Knight. I've been Alan Hees. And Switch uh, for Live. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll catch you next time. Taste my Switch face. Bye. 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 Can you smell a little? little? Tara. <laughs> and cut. Taste my game fix.